out after the attack on Pearl Harbor, produced by Republic Pictures. John Wayne, I'm not going to get into John Wayne and fighting the war and winning it all by himself. However, uh, he did make the movies very popular, and John Wayne, in his usual laconic style, turns up in Flying Tigers. Because Republic, uh, at the time, we, the United States Army Air Force was a little busy fighting the war, that he really couldn't give Republic any real P-40s. So Republic built seven P-40 mock-ups. They were made of wood. Two of them had Curtis OX-5 engines in them for taxiing shots, and the other five had electric motors just to spin the propellers. So those are the ones you see on the ground. Now there's one scene in which, right at the beginning of the movie, when Jim Gordon, played by Wayne, gets out after shooting down half the Japanese Air Force, he lights up a cigarette, and he's walking past his plane. His crew chief is upset with all the bullet holes in the plane. And John Wayne just kind of looks at him with his usual termites. Well, they are wood, after all. In any event, um, Flying Tigers does not tell the real story of the American Volunteer Group. It bears no resemblance to reality, other than they're P-40, they have shark mouth insignia, and they're fighting the Japanese. That's pretty much it. But it's still a fun film. And, but there is one notable aircraft in the movie that really stands out, and it is this one. Right at the very end of the film, the, the guy, John Carroll, who's a friend of, of Gordon's who, uh, who causes all kinds of havoc, and he finally has an epiphany at the end, and he realizes that he was wrong, and he sacrifices his life to save his friend. Um, they fly this transport to, to drop um, na not, uh, nitroglycerin on a Japanese train, and then he ends up crashing into the train, sacrificing himself. This particular plane that you see is unique because it is the one, on, one and only. It was the Capellus XC-12. It was the brainchild of, of a uh, Greek restaurateur named Socrates Capellus who wanted to get into aviation. And so he went to, um, to Caltech and he went to the aeronautical design department and he said, I want you guys, I'm going to pay you guys to design an airplane for me and we're going to start an aircraft company. And they said, sure. So this is what they came up with arguably one of the ugliest planes ever built, um, with a triple rudder and a double stabilizer. And when the CAA, the forerunner of the, uh, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration, tested it, they said, ah, no, this thing is not safe to fly. So it, it, never, it never got anywhere. So it ended up being bought by the studio that turned up a Republic at RKO at MGM. It was used in a movie called um, Five Came Back in 1935 with Lucille Ball, one of the very first airline disaster films. And it turned up in about a, do a dozen uh, serials and shorts. And then it eventually was scrapped and there's nothing left of it. But I've had people ask me, what is that plane you see in Flying Tiger? Well, this is it, the Capellus XT-12. God is My Co-Pilot was the second of the Flying Tigers movie, and it was far more accurate, true to history, than the first one. It tells the story by uh, Robert, Colonel Robert L. Scott when he wrote the book God is My Co-Pilot about his time with the Flying Tigers, both before and after he joined the Army Air Force. What I like about Flying Tigers, not only to tell the truth, but by then they had some real P-40s to fly, and it's much more accurate. There's some great stunning aerial sequences. Um, but of course, we were still fighting the war at the time. So the Air Corps was saying, well, we're going to let you have a few of these. Try not to break them. Um, they had some planes from Luke Air, uh, Army Air Base in, in Arizona, some from San Diego. And they did most of the aerial flying in uh, but training, training squadrons in Arizona, did most of the stunt flying. The Japanese planes were, of course, what every Japanese plane in American movies was, the North American AT-6 Texan. But you'll notice that in this one, they don't even modify the canopy. All they did was paint the big meatball on it, and it's suddenly a zero. <laughs> Later on, studio took a little more time to actually change the canopy and the cowling and make it a little more realistic. But here's what really gets me about God is my co-pilot. 
How many of you have ever had the opportunity to fit inside a P40? They aren't this roomy. Every American war movie of that era, you could put a Barco lounger inside those, inside those planes. There's lots of elbow room. There's a little wet bar next to it. They can kick back. There's, and they have room to turn their heads and do it. Every movie is like that. They're also way too talkative. They're spending more time trading barb with the enemy and with each other than they were with actually flying the airplane. My favorite actor in God is My Co-Pilot is Richard Liu, who played Tokyo Joe. And he, has, he trades witticisms with Dennis Morgan as, as Bob Scott. You can't help but love to hate this guy. But again, he's, you notice he's got his one hand on the microphone. The other hand is supposedly holding the stick. I don't know what he's controlling the throttle with. But <laughs> I've been in a P-40. I've been in an SNJ and a T-86. They do not have that much room. You don't climb into one. You put it on. OK. One of the best air war movies is Battle of Britain. It's actually done in England, telling the story of the Battle of Britain from June to September 1940. They collected a lot of actual original aircraft for the movie, and a, lot of, a lot of Spitfires, a few early models, mostly late models, some hurricanes, um, a lot of German aircraft. What impressed me about Battle of Britain is that they got a dozen technical advisors for the film, British and German. They paid attention. They listened to these people and really got into doing it as accurately as possible. It's probably the best film that has ever been or will ever be made about the Battle of Britain. They had to take a few shortcuts. There weren't a lot of original aircraft left that could still fly. For one thing, they were trying to find some Ju-87 Stukas, and they couldn't. They had one which was going to cost too much money to modify it to get it to fly. So they didn't use that. They did everything with miniatures. And they had some Percival Proctor, which had the gull wing on them. They modified them with wings, wheel spats and changed uh, some of the configuration and repainted them. So the Percival Proctors playing the Stuka were known on the set as Potrukas. They raided the Spanish Air Force and got a hold of a bunch of CASA 2.111s, which were the Heinkels. There were no Dorniers or Junkers available, so the entire German attacking force is made up of HE-111. They are the real thing, but they were built in Spain. Uh, one of them was uh, Francisco Franco's actual transport. Still had the bathroom in it. But um, the German fighters, the ME-109s, were also Spanish. Here's the irony. Every German plane you see in the Battle of Britain is powered by a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. I'm sure Hermann Goering is spinning in his grave. Memphis Bell. Here is a local celebrity in Memphis Bell. This is N17W, which began at the B-17F built at Boeing plant number two, just a short distance away right here in February of 1943. This plane had a long and checkered career. She never saw combat. After the war, she was, uh, was in a park for about five years and then began a long career as a, um, as a crop duster and a, uh, a pesticide sprayer and a, a fire bomber. Had a lot of abuse, a lot of changes. It became less and less a wartime bomber and more and more becoming just a plane that carried a lot of liquid. But by the early 1960s, when some movie studios decided they wanted to, they needed B-17, N-17W turned up in um, The War Lover with Steve McQueen and Robert Wagner, in The Thousand Plane Raid with uh, Christopher George. It was in the TV version of 12 O'Clock High with Paul Burke and um, Robert Lansing. It was in Tora, Tora, Tora in that famous sequence in which the B-17 turned up over Pearl Harbor at the time of the attack. And then it went to England and was in um, Memphis Bell in 1990. But by then, there wasn't much left of a B-17. It was pretty much an empty shell. It was repainted, and they put on the, the, the turret to make it appear proper. 
It looks like a B-17. Uh, in the movie, when you see the plane called Steacup, that is N-17W. In 1993, she was back here in Washington, and she began a 17-year restoration, getting her back to not only wartime condition, but restoring her and giving her back the life. She forget, got her youth back. N-17W is now part of a collection of the Museum of Flight, and it's known as Boeing B. And when you come here after Memorial Day, you'll be able to see this plane. It is the most perfect, perfectly restored B-17F in the world, right down to the very last details inside that aircraft. You are stepping into a 1943 B-17, and that's the one you see in Memphis Bell. I was able to talk to, I've talked to a lot of B-17 crewmen from the war, and they have different opinions about movies, aviation movies. Some of them take 12 o'clock high with the best of them, and some of them will admit that Memphis Bell was pretty good too. Memphis Bell is not historically accurate as far as the story, telling the, the, the true story of the Memphis Bell final mission in 1943. It, it just pretty much takes it and makes it much more dramatic than it actually was using fictional crewmen. But what it really does is it tells what life was like and death was like for those kids when they were flying over Germany at 35,000 feet. What it was really like to be in an aircraft where there was flak exploding outside and there was bullets coming through from attacking fighters, how cold and frightening it was for these kids. That's what it really does. It tells it very, very well. Sean Aston, who was the, uh, the ball turret gunner, Richard Rascal Moore and I talked about the film, and he, at the time, when they were in England, several of the, Bell, the Bell's original crewmen were still alive, and they were there, and they would spend time in the pubs after filming for the day and just swap stories, and he got to really respect these men who had once done the thing that they had. The movie is technically accurate in most respects. It, tell, it, it shows what it's like to be inside a B-17, except for the fact that they're able to talk in conversational tones without the use of a uh, microphone, which you can't do in a flying B-17. But then again, that's Hollywood. The sequence, uh, the most dramatic model sequence, is when one of the B, uh, rookie B-17s is chopped in half by a... Um, a damaged German fighter. And when I first saw this, it, it made me cry. It was so frightening. And I never, never forgot it. And that's the kind of impact this movie had. I talked to Catherine Weiler, who was the producer of the film. Her father was William Weiler, who was the producer during the war. William Weiler had done a movie, a documentary called Memphis Bell, the story of a flying fortress in 1943. It was about the Memphis Bell. So she did this movie partly as a tribute. She'd gotten a lot of criticism, criticism over the years from historians saying, well, it's not the true story of a Memphis Bell's last mission. But I said, Ms. Weiler, I want to tell you, I think, das, uh, I think Memphis Bell is the das boot of bomber movies. If that's what you were trying to achieve, you did a very good job. Fighter Squadron, 1948. This is one where I was actually able to talk to an actor who was in the, the oldest one that I was able to talk to an actor, and that was Jack Larson, who some of you remember from The Adventures of Superman as Jimmy Olsen. This was his favorite first uh, motion picture. A neighbor of mine, Colonel Steve Pisano, who was a double ace with the fourth fighter group, and I once discussed, we watched this movie together and we discussed it, and he was explaining about how certain things were done in the Air Force, how they, how fighter squadron, grouped, how they came in for landing, how they took off, how emergencies were handled. He said, what you're seeing in the movie is the way it's really done. It is very accurate, very, very well done, and very, real, very um, authentic. But he said, there's one thing that they just don't get right. They talk too much. In these planes, these guys are singing to each other. They're telling jokes, and they're, they're, they're trading barbs and witticism back and forth when radio silence was supposed to be the order of the day. He said, you'd never get away with that. If there was that much talking in the cabin, the first thing you would do when you landed was you'd be brought before the group commander. If you were lucky, you'd get to fly again. Jack Larson worked under 
Raul Walsh during the film, when they filmed it at Oscoda, Michigan, Lake Michigan played the part of the English Channel. And he was so excited and so nervous that the very first day when he was being called out to the flight line to do some uh, shot in, inside the P50, P-47, he had on his flight suit and his flight gear, he was ready. They called him out and said, hey, Larson, come on out. And he ran out toward the plane. And he's so excited, he's not really looking where he's going. And he ends up running directly into the tail of one of the P-47s. He caught the rudder right between the eyes and knocked him out. Split his skull open. He was out for three days. Well, it didn't ruin his, his career, but he said, that's what I remember most about Fighter Squadron. Tora, 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 my friend J.D., one of his favorite films. This was a, a major epic by 20th Century Fox to tell the story of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Probably the best ever made and will ever be made. A lot of real aircraft in it, um, and I'm going to get to those in a moment. But there's one moment in the film that you wonder if it actually happened, and it actually did. It was early, just, just before the attack, and you see this um, N2S Stearman flying along through the valleys in Oahu, and then suddenly just surrounded by Japanese planes who are looking down at it, and the Japanese pilots are looking at it, this is the best they can do. And there's a woman pilot who's uh, an instructor. Well, that actually happened. Her name was Cornelia Fort, and she was a woman's air service pilot who was um, moonlighting as a civilian pilot instructor. And she was flying an interstate cadet monoplane. And they were doing some training flights over the center of the island, and she saw the Japanese force coming in over the center of the island. Now, they never got as close as in the movie. But when she saw all those meatballs up there, she decided to get the heck out of there. But this actually did happen. It's a real event. 20th Century Fox assembled 12 zeros, 9 Val, and 9 Kate torpedo bombers for the film. They are all American aircraft. They took the AT-6 Texan, turned them into zero with the modification of a cowling and a cockpit. And they took the other AT-60s and turned them into Kate torpedo bombers by extending the fuselage and adding a new con um, canopy and putting on a torpedo. And the valve would be Vulti BT-13 Valiants. They put all these planes together and did such a great job in, in, um, in recreating the non-existent Japanese planes that when they, they were done in Long Beach and they were flown down to San Diego to North Island, they were going to be loaded aboard the USS Yorktown for the takeoff sequences off the coast. They flew right over the golf course of North Island in formation. And there were two men on the golf course that day, and they were two retired admirals. What, a rat, what else do admirals have to do but play golf, right? And one of them was Admiral Elliot Buckmaster, and the other was Cap Admiral Max Leslie. Buckmaster had been the captain of USS Yorktown during the Battle of Midway, and Leslie had been the air group commander. They're playing golf, and they hear propeller planes. Now, this is the late 1960s, and they say, oh, and they have to look up, and they saw 30 Japanese planes coming in. Buckmaster grabbed Leslie and turned him around and said, Max, Max, what is this? Didn't we shoot all those SOBs, SOBs down? That's how good they were. Anyway, a good friend of the museum um, is a, uh, a fighter ace named Dean Diz Laird. He lived down in Coronado. He was one of the Japanese pilots for the film along with uh, Admiral Paul Gilchrist. I talked to both of them. They told me a lot about the trivia of, of the background of working on this film. This is uh, Dean Laird dropping a torpedo on the USS West Virginia during the initial attack of the movie. Um, they had to wear brown flight suits, the fur line flight suits. They, they did everything so they would look as Japanese as possible without actually changing their makeup and everything. And he said that one time after filming, they all went to a restaurant, still in uniform. That must have been something to see in a restaurant in Honolulu in 1969. In any event, um, 
one of the um, most famous sequences in uh, Tora 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 is the B-17 belly landing sequence. Now, one of these planes, as I said, was N-17W. But this was not scripted. This happened literally by accident. When they were filming the sequences of the plane coming in, being strafed by the Japanese, the, um, one of the B-17 called in and said, we can't get our right wheel down. So director Richard Fleischer, think quick, and he said, all right, stay up there a little bit longer, use up your fuel, we want to get some cameras set up. So they weren't, they hadn't planned on it, they said, well, let's use it, you know. So when you watch the sequence, you'll see the B-17 come in, and it'll come right out of a cloud of smoke. And it's still flying level, all four engines are going. And then instantly, the next shot is what you see at the bottom here, is of it skidding in on the right wing tip, and the both of the right engines are shut off. They filmed that on, literally on the fly in order to get it into the movie. So as I said, that was not scripted. The P-40 sequences are fantastic. The, the, the cockpit mock-up, they're literally complete aircraft with, uh, with machine guns. They're very well done, showing uh, Lieutenant Taylor and Welsh going up there and attacking the, the Japanese force. Now those P-40s,